Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. And uh, it's very interesting watching Hilmar's presentation and the company kind of positioning of virtual worlds more meaningful than real life. I hope he succeeds in that because I hope virtual worlds are a lot warmer than real life. <clears throat> I can see why an Icelandic company will be uh, <laughs> making these breakthroughs. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my journey. And I know we're, we're probably a little bit behind, but I hope we, we all, we'll try to save a few minutes to ask some questions if that's still reasonably possible. So we'll see what we can do. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today um, in talking about stories, um, I thought you might like this quote from Marcus, if it's readable. This is the video game industry, <clears throat> and we're going to talk about how it... Uh, how it's uh, evolved and how it, you know, kind of my journey, how Iceland kind of intersects with what I, um, what I do and what investments uh, we like to look at in London Venture Partners. So first of all, who am I? You, you heard a little bit of introduction. Um, I started because this motivated me. Um, I, um, I don't know why, but um, it, it was just incredibly cool. And that's basically all I've done all my life. I was uh, in Chicago at the Consumer Electronics Show um, promoting Atari. Uh, I was a young teenager in that photograph. <clears throat> and uh, then I went on to Electronic Arts, where I was um, an older teenager, uh, where I started. And we had uh, a big push to uh, sell our products at retail, so we created the Electronic Arts Gallery. Uh, then I went on to fulfill my life's ambitions and run Atari, um, which was a horrible disaster. and my my uh, life's ambitions came crashing down. Uh, so I recovered myself by realizing, well, if you, you, know, if you can't make great, great games anymore, you should go and become an investor. So that's what I do now. Um, I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I kind of came to Iceland. And um, of course, I flew. And uh, it's because of my love of planes. And I, I had an airplane that I, I bought. And I decided I was going to have a big life adventure and fly from San Francisco to London. So Iceland is on the way. You can see from this map, um, in these little planes, you can't go straight to Boston. You have to go via the so-called Blue Spruce route, the northern route, where you can land every few hours and survive. So I wore my exposure suits uh, with my best friend from high school, and that's to keep you alive if you fall into the North Atlantic. You have a, about a 30-second survival rate without it and about a 10-minute survival rate with it. So. <laughs> really improves the situation. But I was so successful, I, uh, I set a speed record between the north of Scotland and Reykjavik. So um, yeah, so I thought I'd, this is my first chance to, to show it off. And that's my, my approach at the, uh, the, the downtown Reykjavik airport called Burke. Um, but I found paradise. And if you survive crossing the North Atlantic, especially after Greenland, um, you sort of think, gosh, Iceland looks amazing. And what really blew me away was there are these two beautiful blonde women helping you park the airplane. And I think, where have I landed? It's incredible. Uh, then I met uh, Hilmar and some of the CCP guys, and they took me to this incredible sushi restaurant. And, and my, at that time, BlackBerry just kind of jumped on the network, and suddenly I'm reconnected to civilization. So what an incredible place. I went first to their amazing cathedral, and I gave thanks to God for being alive. Then I walked around town, and I found electronic arts. I found electronic arts in the, in the uh, football pitch, and I thought, incredible, they play games here. So um, this is a, an amazing place. So London Venture Partners are myself and, and three other partners. We are um, really from the, the gaming industry. I like to say that I'm a, I'm a fake investor because I really don't know anything about investing. I really only know about computer games. Um, but we, we realized there was a hole in the market. This is the kind of current size of the industry. It's, a little bit of a confusing chart that I snatched off the internet, but um, current data says the industry is $91 billion. So it's up 9%. Um, I checked on the CIA database uh, for national statistics. So Americans like to keep this data. And apparently Iceland has a GDP of $15 billion. Uh, so if any of these numbers are relatable and make any sense at all, it suggests the global games industry is several times larger than the domestic economy of Iceland. So I thought, well, that's a pretty good place to, to invest and, and make money. It's a very um, difficult market because financial investors are terrified of investing in games. And they always say, you know, you ask them, why is that? And they say, well, it's because it's a hits-driven business. 
And I say, well, but that's what investing is. You, hits, hit companies pay for the failed companies. This is exactly the same in the games industry. It's just that investors feel like they understand what makes a company succeed, whereas they don't really understand why a game works or why a game doesn't work. So I'll tell you what we use as a filter when we look at these investments. First of all, we are maybe the only game-focused investment fund. There are lots of funds that have invested in games, but they tend to be general tech funds, and so they'll be mixing investments between games and you know, compression technology and et cetera, et cetera. Especially if you want, I just started watching the Silicon Valley thing on HBO, which is, uh, which is hilarious. Um, so we focus on games, and, and that's obviously a criteria for us. It doesn't have to necessarily be a game, but it has to be related to the game economy. Uh, we've looked at making investments in uh, digital money. We've looked at and have invested in things like Unity. So you can see these are kind of game-related things, but not necessarily a game. And we like to see the team having several important qualities. They need to be intelligent. They need to have insight. That's a picture of... Sigmund Freud, if you don't know what he looks like. Um, and I don't know who the passionate guy is, but you know, somebody, is, you, you really have to have the passion for what you're doing because it's a very hard journey being a startup and a very hard journey in games because of all the competition. And we like to see people who actually make progress and actually do things. So it's very easy to talk um, and not so easy to do. So we want to see execution and progress. And we want to see things moving quickly. I think that's, that's a key characteristic of how the industry is today, um, especially with the advent of mobile and the app store and the digital economy. This has been a uh, very important competitive pressure. And the idea of moving quickly also leads to iteration. So you need to listen to what the customer is saying, often through the telemetry from the game itself, and make the changes and the iterations, and do that on a rapid cadence so that you can stay stay ahead. And we also think that curiosity is a key attribute because we need to explore new ideas, we need to explore new genres, we don't want everything to simply be a copycat. I can't tell you how many clones of Clash of Clans I've seen, um, but really I think we find that innovation is really rewarded in the industry. And we're careful not to be focused on one particular product or one, one game. We like to see either something that can become a genre or a family of products. I use the EA Sports um, family there as an example. But it, it could also be more like uh, a, a game as a, a full-time hobby or a service. I mean, something like um, uh, CCP's Eve or Clash of Clans really is, is almost like a lifestyle choice. Um, and you know, that obviously creates a, a very valuable franchise. And we also like to feel like we understand you know, why this is good. We can't, you know, if it's too complicated, too esoteric, um, we just want to know it tastes good and it's like ice cream. You know, it's straightforward, it's simple. And finally, for us, I think it is very much, you know, this industry of, of all industries, we're dealing with people. And we want to, we frankly, just want to love each other. We want to feel like it's so much fun to do this together. Um, if you can't like your investor and your investor doesn't like you, maybe just find another investor. Um, so let's talk about where a lot of those things lined up. Uh, many of you people um, will have you know, played a Supercell game, know them. Is there anyone from Supercell here by any chance? Okay, good. I can tell the stories without any word. So back in 2010, that's a picture of, of Ilka Pannanen. So he and uh, his kind of co-founders um, you know, did the usual thing. They got Hewlett Packard boxes and put Apple computers on top of them. And, um, and started Supercell. And today there are 160 people, mainly in Helsinki and San Francisco, and they have an incredible philosophy that um, I think has served them well. Uh, and I love their, their, their phrase, we drink beer when our games are successful and champagne when they fail. Um, both are to be celebrated. Uh, but when you, when you drink beer, you're a little bit more humble, you're still having a good time, but by drinking champagne when they fail, they're saying, it's okay to try. Um, and that is so, so important. I remember a long time I've been at, I was at Electronic Arts. And as we got big and successful, we became afraid to fail. In fact, it was disgraceful to fail. And if you failed, it wouldn't be unusual to be fired. And we started setting the wrong tone around failure. And so I love Supercell's approach. Um, they go further and they talk about some of these, some of these other things. And, you know, you can... Um, you can say there are a lot of Nordic values here. And I, and I would say, I would submit one of the reasons there are an, an unusual 
pro rata to the size of population and usual number of successful games companies coming out of the Nordic territory. I think a lot of it is um, just the general attitude. There's more kind of humility and focus on kind of doing things well and listening to the customer. And I think that's served people well. So I love their list of, um, of values. And it's played out through the games. Incredible successes on the charts. Um, very interesting statistics. Um, you know, I know there's somebody from Tekes here. I mean, Supercell continues to pay lots of taxes. They've more than paid, all of, obviously, their Tekes money back, but they've paid a lot of money into the state government's funds. So that, that's creating a positive cycle for the ecosystem, which is absolutely fantastic. And if you compare um, the giant electronic arts and Supercell in the mobile space, you can just see what a difference the modern economy can deliver. Supercell is incredibly focused, incredibly lean, and they make more money than electronic arts. Um, and in the old days, I probably would have wanted a giant empire and all these people reporting to me. And what I've realized is, gosh, that's just a hassle. What I actually really want is a fantastically focused team doing excellent work delighting people around the world. And um, I, I'll drill down just a little bit in, into why I think this is so relevant to, to this community that's assembled today. The, I mean, I think we all obviously know the digital economy and we moved from packaged goods, et cetera. The, the kind of business philosophy behind it was to succeed in the packaged goods world, you needed physical infrastructure globally, and that required a lot of people to do the sales, the delivery, and that whole process. So it meant a very few companies got to be global, and they would kind of be the successive winners. Uh, so you almost always the companies were from large countries. Uh, so of course the U.S. had a high number, and, and Japan had a high number, and hardly any from Europe. Ubisoft would probably be the only one. And what's changed dramatically is now with digital distribution, a great idea can go directly to a consumer through Apple Store or Google's Play Store. And so these kind of digital global infrastructures can be hired and jumped on literally by the tick of a box on an initial setup screen. Well, I helped Supercell launch their products in Japan. And it was the most incredible experience because I had launched businesses in Japan before in other countries. And you would go and spend months trying to figure out who to hire and what to do. And you'd start hiring people. You'd need at least 12 people to build an electronic arts office. You'd have to have head of, head of the company, head of sales, head of marketing, head of human resources, head of finance. Head of, so you would, a minimum size was 12. And to assemble a team of 12 and get them functioning would usually take at least a year. We went for one week to Japan. We met an excellent um, localization team. We met the ad agency network. And they were able to go on, hire one person for customer support, tick one box on the Apple Store, and release the Japanese language version of Clash of Clans. Ads the um, ad networks in Japan, and they went in, in that operation, hiring one person, they added $60 million in revenue just overnight. And it was incredible to see that. And I thought, wow, the model has so changed. Um, and that means a team in Finland can sell directly to 100 million consumers in Japan. Um, and that is the digital economy. So that's what's so incredibly powerful in reshaping the economics. So, why I do this? Well, I do this because I love games, and I love um, the industry, and I also just want to kind of prevent this from happening. <laughs> yeah, so we need to have incredible social responsibility when we build these VR products um, so that we avoid that. So what you should do in a result, as a result of that, you should get excited and you should make some things. So with that, I'd like to just say, if we have a few minutes, we could maybe just go into questions. Anything you guys want to ask about anything, I'd be very happy to try to give you my point of view. Just raise your hand, and uh, this is when you have to drop the Nordic shyness and just kind of come right out. Anything? Anyone? No? OK. In the very back, I can't. Yeah. So the development cost being massive, uh, is it over? Um, no, it's not over. It's just uh, constructed slightly differently. 
So uh, in the old days, we would the, the industry grew, grew to the point where literally, you know, uh, I guess Grand Theft Auto was was promoted as perhaps the most expensive development. GTA 5 was the most expensive um, development. And then you'd have to buy the inventory. So it, you could easily spend 100 to 200 million on development, and then you could spend 100 million on building the physical goods and the marketing, et cetera. So you could, you could be negative cash, two or 300 million, before you get the first money back from the consumer. What, what is now an opera, and that still can happen, and there are some guys obviously doing that, but the, the big difference now is you can spend maybe $500,000 or maybe a million dollars to build something that's good enough, minimum viable product, to then release, and people can start paying you then, and you do continuous development along that journey. So if I think about Clash of Clans, over two years old, um, you know, when it first came out, they had spent about six or seven hundred thousand um, dollars. Today, I would say the total development spent on that game is probably ten to fifteen million dollars, but it's continuously evolving. But and they've earned against it. So now you can verify your idea, and you can uh, you can have the funding come with the continuous development. Um, so it's just a very different risk, you know, doing the massive uh, development risks, um, and it still will happen because of the console cycle. But I think for a startup company, you, you can't fund it. It, it. It's insane. And you don't need to. So that's what I would say. Please. Yeah, so I, well, to be fair to EA, I have now been gone about seven years, so it's probably hard for me to give you a, an honest insight into how the morale is. I think um, one simple measure is the stock price, and it's kind of massively recovered. So I, I have spoken to a few happy EA people since then. Um, having said that, it's not all about money. So I think the creative frustration of being on a treadmill where you're forced to kind of work on these 12-month cycles has been very hard for, for a lot of the creative teams. And um, I think EA has tried uh, different things. They've tried to let um, people move between creative teams. Um, and that's been kind of their approach. And then they zigzag between trying to have smaller independent studios and kind of creating the Borg and one central organization. So they kind of go back and forth. Um, and for a lot of the studios now, there's a Swedish guy uh, that's in charge. Uh, and, and that's one thing I give EA credit for, is that at the top level, actually, they're not all Americans. I mean, the, the new CEO is an Australian, head of most of product development is Swedish. Um, so they are, they are trying. Um, but I think at the end of the day, you, you kind of know as a person, do you want to work in a giant organization which has uh, positives and negatives, or do you want to work in a more smaller family family style, and then you have to build or work toward yeah, what you're particularly good at. How many people are working on VR type things here? You want to raise your hand? Sort of about 30, 40 percent. I think it's a really good question. Um, I haven't, we haven't, I'll give you some general answers. I wouldn't say we've got a clear, here's the perfect answer for us. Yeah, I mean, so, um, did, if everyone heard that, basically what, what's the view on funding in VR? So we've, we funded lots of different businesses, uh, so not free to play things like Unity or um, 
people that were doing premium price product originally on iOS. And now the large part of the market is free to play. VR, uh, my view is initially the market isn't big enough to sustain the free to play model. Uh, so it's likely to be initially sold and, and the, the setup of the devices, et cetera, are fairly hardcore. So it's going to be to more of a classic computer gamer type player. Hundreds of dollars being spent on the device. Um, you have to be competent enough to update your driver software, and um, which I seem to have fallen behind because I can't get my Unreal 4 drivers update for uh, Valkyrie. Um, and therefore, I, uh, the way I would describe it is it's going to be a high ARPU, a high revenue per paying user, and a low number of installed base users. So I would tend to favor investing in companies that can um, come up with something convincing and also do it in a cost-effective way. Um, my worry is that gaming started on mobile pretty simple. People were often just one person basically working for themselves, not earning a salary, taking time off from work or doing it as a hobby thing, and then they would come up with something that could succeed and it might make money. And if you, if you basically spend very little, $50,000, $100,000, and you make a million dollars, whoa, that's fantastic. It feels really good. So that's kind of like the hobbyist lifestyle dream come true. If you're trying to build a business around that and you've got dozens or hundreds of employees, suddenly you're spending millions of dollars and you need to make tens and hundreds of millions of dollars. And that's kind of where a professional investor starts to get interested uh, because of the business model of, of the investing. So hobbyists don't really get invested in. It's kind of a passion and a love. And then you've got this kind of 100 million plus company. That starts to be interesting for investing. VR is uncomfortably stuck in the middle um, because to me, if I look at the math, unless you happen to be lucky enough to do Oculus and sell it to Facebook for $2 billion, it's going to be really, really hard to build a company that's worth hundreds of millions in the initial stages. Yet the game quality, the visual quality, is going to be quite demanding uh, because, of the, because of the environment that you're in. A casual uh, game on iOS doesn't have to look amazing. I mean, uh, yeah. So this is a, an uncomfortable thing. And some people have different approaches to how they're going to solve that. They're going to be reusing um, assets that are existing in asset stores. Um, they're going to be trying to add incrementally VR to existing 2D products. So we're going to have a lot of pain to go through before we get to um, a healthy cycle, I think. But we're, we're open to investing in VR, but just not, you know, we're kind of cautiously conservative. I mean, I'm, I'm excited, but I'm, I'm sensible. <laughs> I'm being timed over. Game over, time over. Thank you very much.